So when he was in the detention facility, I just went over to take a peek at him, and the admiral in charge of the task force walks out and says, uh, hey, Mark, would you spend this first night with him because uh, I don't want him to martyr himself. And I'm like, you're sure I'll go. Absolutely. So, wow. And I go uh, into the cell with the captured king of Babylon. Did you have any um, hesitation about that or any, I mean, you know? No hesitation whatsoever. Um, the opportunity, I mean, if you think about it in the historical sense, Hitler killed himself. We never captured him. Pol Pot, you know, we never captured him. Uh, I mean, this is one of the most notorious dictators of all time. Uh, we had him captured, and I got to go in and spend that night with him. And then, by happenstance, uh, he couldn't sleep, I guess, and decided to be talkative. So we had about a six-hour conversation. Wow. And um, remind me, did he speak um, English? Did he speak in his language, both? He spoke Arabic uh, in the interview. I, I assume he knew how to speak English. He just chose not to. We had an interpreter in the room, though. So, um, so it was kind of the three of you. Yeah, the three of us to start. And then an intelligence officer came in a few hours after that and sat in the room with us. Um, and about 6 o'clock that morning, the commander came back in and said, Hey, Mark, what's going on? I'm like, well, we're just chatting. And he goes, oh, we've got to get this on tape. So they go out and get a camera. And as soon as the red record light come, came on, you know, Saddam pulled the blankets up over his head into conversation. So. Well, I stopped talking. Didn't yeah. want to be on camera. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Why um, do you suppose yeah. that is? You just I think it was something that I found to be uh, very interesting. The detainees, and we captured... Saddam's girlfriend, we captured his uh, secretary, his cook, his physician, and I would go over in many of the cases and do the physical exams on these guys. And they enjoyed talking to someone who wasn't trying to get intelligence from them. So there was that, I don't know, it was just an interesting dynamic where they would talk to us, and then when it became an investigation, they stopped talking. So. Wow. Um, what was that conversation like? Um, what, what, was the, what were you talking about? Well, I, I think some of the things that stand out to me from the conversation was just Saddam's megalomania. Um, you know, we had done all these missions around Iraq. Every time you go in a city, there's a statue of Saddam or there's a painting of Saddam. Um, and that night, he really proved that to be true, that he was this megalomaniac. I asked him, why did you invade Kuwait, you know, in Desert Storm 1? And he said uh, lots of different reasons about the justification of the oil fields and things like that, but his last explanation was insightful. He said, all of humankind comes from the Tigris and Euphrates River. In fact, everybody is essentially an Iraqi. Everybody on the planet is an Iraqi, and I'm the president of Iraq. He was saying, you know, I'm, I can do whatever I want. I'm, I'm the president of the world. And I believe that was his mentality. And, and when I did research for my book, you know, I think Saddam thought he was Nebuchadnezzar, sort of the return of uh, the king of Babylon. So. Well, and, and it seemed he really believed that. I think he really did. And in our conversation, he mentioned Abdul Nasser, who was the president of Egypt at the time Saddam fled after he first attempted a coup on the then president of Iraq. He fled to Egypt, lived in Egypt. And, and throughout our conversation, he kept bringing Abdul Nasser up. Well, Abdul Nasser was the last really true pan-Arabic leader that all of the Arabic people uh, seem to uh, have an affinity for. Uh, if there was a guy who could unite the Arab peoples, it would have been Abdul Nasser. And I think Saddam was trying to paint himself in the light of Abdul Nasser. Um, what did you get <clears throat> as a sense of his, sort of his personality? You talked about this megalomania, but what, what other things? He was charming. Happen? I mean, really, I remember reminding myself, Mark, don't become enamored by this guy because he'd kill your family for even a false confession. Uh, but he, he was extremely charming. And I got the thought of this is, this is what cult of personality is uh, because clearly he was an evil guy. I mean, he used mustard agent on his own people. Um, so, uh, you know, bad guy, but extremely charming in our interview. He, he treated me much like I were some underling 
documenting, uh, you know, some historical thing. He sat very, you know, straight and was somewhat aloof but very talkative. So. Well, why do you think um, that he felt so comfortable? I'm not sure he really knew or appreciated what we were going to do, and that, and that is turn him over to the Iraqi people. I think he thought if we had tried him or, you know, perhaps there'd be no big deal. He'd get away or something like that. But when we turned him over to the Iraqi people, it, it sealed his fate. Um, so I'm pretty sure he had no inclination that that was going to happen. Wow. Um, did, you know, sometimes you get a, a sense of when you walk into a room, you get an energy from people, <clears throat> especially people who are celebrities or leaders or that sort of thing. Sure. Did you get any sort of energy or, you know, from, from him? Well, imagine the moment, you know, I had just done about 50 missions in combat, you know, with guys shooting at you and stuff like that. Um, and that means 49 of them, it wasn't exactly 50, but some number, 49, for the sake of telling the story, uh, were empty dry holes, um, nothing there. Suddenly we have the guy. I mean, we have captured Saddam Hussein, and I am walking into the cell to spend that first night with him. Um, the elation of the moment of having done that, the, the moment in history, the weight of it was on, on my shoulders as I walked in the room. It was so surreal. I kind of tell people it was almost like I was watching it happen from outside myself can't believe I'm, I'm in the room with Saddam Hussein on the night of his capture. But there I was. Wow. Um, and then you, um, what compelled you to write the book about it? I mean, I know there were other people who were there. You, are you the only one who chose to write about it? Well, in the room with him that night was just myself, the interpreter, and uh, an intelligence officer. And later, another physician came in closer to the, to the end of the conversation. But so... I'm the only guy that interviewed him that night. They're the only guy that could write that book would be me. Uh, and then some of the things that he said to me, I hadn't found in any other history book, particularly uh, one case was why he went to war with Iran. The Iran-Iraq war killed millions, uh, and, or hundreds of thousands at least. Uh, and, you know, his reasoning wasn't in any history book, but he told me that night why he invaded Ar Iran. Um, so I thought those things needed to be in the history books. Well, why, why did he say he did that? Well, uh, he was then the second in command of Iraq when Khomeini fled Iran prior to the fall of the Shah. Well, Khomeini is a Shia Muslim leader, and he comes into the second most holy Shia site, which is in Iraq. Iraq is a Shia country, but Saddam was a Sunni leader, so I'm sure Saddam felt very threatened having Khomeini. So he goes to, I believe it was Karbala, where um, Khomeini was living at the time, and basically brokers a deal with him. Okay, you can stay here, except when you get in power in Iran, you're going to cede some coastline to me. So Saddam needed a, a better piece of coastline to get his oil exported through the Persian Gulf. When Khomeini came to power, he reneged on the deal, and Saddam invaded to take basically by force what had been promised to him in a deal. Yeah, that nobody knew about. That nobody knew about. Wow. What what other things kind of stood out about that night? I, of course, his you know that whole notion that he was the president of the world. But I think one of the other very interesting uh, answers to a question he gave, I asked him, "Did you think that the Americans would respond the way we did when you invaded Kuwait?" Desert Storm One, and he said, no, I, I thought you guys would attack right away, and I could have fought a good fight had you attacked right away. Since it took you six months to build up your force and your coalition, um, I couldn't sustain my forces logistically that far forward. My guys' morale was down, we were, they weren't supplied, you attacked, and, and we lost, and, my, and they gave up right away. I thought that was an incredibly cogent answer from a guy who you know, was a megalomaniac. He had really thought that one through. So. Wow, so he was being very candid. Oh, incredibly so. 
Um, what do you remember about how he looked? I mean, that, that picture of how he looked was so wild haired because I, I get the sense that he always prided himself on looking perfect. I think a lot of that, you know, when we captured him and, and sort of got him in the room and started cleaning him up, in fact, my medics were the guys that shaved him and did all that. Um, as that process was happening and as he was going from looking like a common guy to what he looked like when, when I actually went in to see him, uh, that process was sort of, you know, I don't want to say manufactured, but you know, there's an, in combat there's an information war. And as we show pictures of Saddam, we, want the, we wanted the Iraqi people to see how helpless he was at that moment because that would, one, motivate the ones who wanted to see him capture, but it would deflate the morale of anybody who might come to his defense. So I think that was just a part of the information war. When I saw him, he was cleaned up, looked fine, in, uh, in great health. He had a little bit of high blood pressure, and that was it. Wow. Did you actually do the physical exam? No, another physician did that, actually. Um, I was still sort of covering the target because when they get when you're doing one of these missions and, and the object of the mission gets taken off the target, you know, the good guys are still kind of cleaning up on the target. So a firefight could have still ensued and they would have need, needed my, you know, medical expertise. Um, he was already back, cleaned up by the time I flew back into the, to the area. And then, uh, you know, after I cleaned my equipment, ran over just to get a peek at him in the detention facility, only to be told, hey, will you spend this first night with him? Wow. So. Um, and so he'd never slept, or did he? Sleep? No, he didn't. I mean, and who knows what cycle he was on. Of course, for us, dawn was dusk and dusk was dawn. You know, we did all our missions at night. Uh, but um, uh, it, I went in about midnight, and, and he stayed up till 6 a.m. when the camera started rolling. While well, just talking? Just chatting. I mean, he was really very talkative. And it's interesting, too, what started the conversation with Saddam Hussein. He calls me over to take his blood pressure, sort of, you know, motions. And so I come over and I'm taking his blood pressure. And when you're taking somebody's blood pressure, you're right in their face. So I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, and Saddam Hussein just very nonchalantly says, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be a doctor, but politics had too great a hold on my heart. So this image of the butcher of Baghdad taking the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, you know, started that six-hour conversation. Wow. So... And now I'm a politician, so go figure. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that is just amazing. Is there, is there anything else you, you want um, people to know, you know, as part of the story as we look back? I think that the thing to remember, you know, as, as amazing as being in the cell with Saddam Hussein was, it pales to insignificance. The privilege that I had serving with our nation's you know, elite warriors, and taking care of their health, taking care of their family's health when we were back in the U.S., and just getting to know them personally. Um, they are unbelievable professionals who are totally dedicated to the freedom of this country, um, willing to write a blank check, w w cashable all the way up to their life. Uh, and I think sometimes we forget, too, not just the soldier, but the families. And there are families, there are little girls out there that will never know their father because he died in combat. And that's a price of freedom that we sometimes forget. The soldier gave his life, but that little girl gave her dad forever. And um, if there's anything we should be thinking about as we reflect on the anniversary of Saddam's capture, it should be their sacrifice. So. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I think that's good unless there's anything else. No. If you want to tell the story about this, and I don't know if you do, but an interesting side story to this, and I think I, I am getting to know you well enough to know that you'll appreciate this story. My mom and dad, my dad's a Southern Baptist pastor in South Mississippi. He sent a letter out to all of his pastor friends. Let's fast and pray December 12th that they capture Saddam Hussein. And my mom and dad on December the 12th fasted and prayed, and along with however many other pastors that they capture Saddam Hussein and my mom and dad's prayer you know because they knew who I am and how I'm made and they added hey let Mark be a part of it within nine hours I was walking into the cell with Saddam 